Good morning. good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you as we get started this morning. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to stop and thank you so much for this day you've made. Lord, we recognize that this is the first day of a brand new year. And Lord, I pray that every day this year, Lord, we would take time in our day to talk to you. Father, seek to walk with you. Father, read in your word. Obey me. And Lord, I pray that as we seek to walk with you, as we seek to draw near to you, Lord, that you will keep your promise true, that you will draw near to us. Father, I pray for your hand of blessing and protection in our lives this year. Lord, use us. Use us for your glory and honor. Lord, please bless our service here this morning. We ask that you would bless each aspect of it. Father, as we worship you, Father, as we give to you, and Father, as we spend time in your word, Lord, may Jesus Christ be glorified. And we ask all these things in your precious and your most holy name. Amen. All right. January. Who's got a January birthday? Is that it? Well, come on. Don't be shy. All we're going to do is make you come up here and tell us how I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to the youth. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you all. I hope you have wonderful birthdays. We haven't passed it yet because it's day one. And Nobody has a birthday today, right? Okay, I didn't think so. That would be a unique birthday, right? You start your year off right every year. All right, let's go ahead and say our brand new memory verse for the month of January and for the beginning of this year. And there, I failed to mention this in Sunday school this morning, but our verses this year are going to have a centralized theme on serving Him. It is my hope and prayer that we individually in our own personal walks with the Lord and even corporately together as brothers and sisters in Christ and even as a body of believers here as this church that we will seek to serve the Lord in this coming year with every opportunity he presents us with. So let us serve him. Let's say our verse together. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider how great things he have done for you. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Would you all stand with me now as we begin to praise and worship our great God?
over this past year, they have been coming together with other churches and trying to um, create something called The Collective. And with that, they are trying to get a bunch of leaders from all over Ecuador, um, Germany, and the United States, and a few other places um, to just see what they can do together, all together. Uh, so they've called it The Collective, and they're talking about going, gathering, and sending. So they're looking into becoming sending churches. Um, with that, they have lots of families all over uh, joining with that and just sharing God's word. And they ask for their prayers and helping um, take care of those families with financial support. Um, they also um, are able to start a few internship opportunities as well with this next year. So that's something new that they ask for us to pray for them in starting that. And I just ask with how their family is changing and how their ministry is developing that uh, we just pray for them and taking care of them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. First of all, <clears throat> men, we are looking for volunteers. We need you here tomorrow evening about 4 o'clock. Uh, if you can make it, we are going to be tearing up carpet. We're going to get new carpet over here. So if you can help, please come and get her done. Um, let's see. What else have we got? Uh, no wine or anything like that tonight. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to have our regular prayer meeting. And then Thursday is the Golden Group uh, and their activities there at 12 noon. Uh, if you can come, you'll have a good time. Pastor's going to talk about the, the other stuff that's there. I think that's just about everything that we've got. Are you ready for the new year? Yeah. We're starting it out right. We're starting it out in church. That's good. <laughs> From then on, we're going to see what's going to happen. Anybody uh, do your New Year's re re resolutions <laughs> and, and already have broken them? <laughs> yeah, that happens. Yeah. That's why I don't do it. All right. Anything else? Something we need to mention or note? All right. Thank you. All right. I failed to grab one. Hey, James. I'll put you to good work here, but would you give me one of the Bible reading brochures there at the back table? Okay. I'll stand and look at him, but he's going to hate me for this. I just hold it up nice and high, James. There are brochures at the back table. There's some out in the foyer, some in the hallways. Those, if you are not digitally inclined and you want a physical hard copy, you stop and grab one of those. Um, thanks, buddy. My own personal day um, This is not something that's being mandated, but something I want to encourage everyone in our church to do, and probably one or two more times over the course of the next month, I'll probably be doing this. You know, for those who uh, may not be with us today, but there is a app that you can get on your phone, and I want to challenge us to, together as a church, read through God's Word. Now, it's not overwhelming. In fact, it's actually a two-year plan. So this time next year, we'll be marking how we've already gotten halfway through. We've got one more year to go. But... If you don't like digital apps, you can get and follow along with us. And even in the bulletin every week, because on that brochure, it has day one all the way through day 730 listed, what the Bible reading is for each day. Now, if you're someone who may lose track of that, we're going to help you out with that. Because in the bulletin every week, our, our wonderful secretary will update the numbers so you know that, okay, this week is days 8 through 14, or this is days eight or 22 through 35, whatever it may be, if you lose track. But... For those of you who want to download the app, it's called Bible Study Together app. It's a free app. I encourage you to use it because there are some pretty unique features that I think can be beneficial to us. Not only does it give us the, the verses that we can be reading every day, but there's actually, it kind of almost has like format like Facebook. So you can actually check off that you read that day, and then there's some questions that you can use in your own personal devotional time, or there's even a place where you can comment and be like, you know what? Verse 4 today, I didn't know I was going to read it, but it was just what I needed 
and the Lord provide you there. And you can post that on there and be an encouragement or share a question, and it can become a platform that we can use. I believe you can put prayer requests or other things up there. It's one of those things we're not requiring, but it's something we can do together, and I think it would be kind of neat for those who want to get involved that we're reading through it together. And then when we come across verses, we can be reading the same verses and discussing with each other. We don't spend enough time as God's people talking about Him and His Word together. He ought to be the main thing we talk about, amen? <coughs> we should talk about God with each other, right? That's, that's a little bit Okay, but Folks, like I said, if you already have a Bible plan, a reading plan that you do on your own, feel free to stick with it. This is just encouragement that's something we can do together. The, the app is just, when you look it up, whether it's on Apple or Android, whatever it may be, it's got it's a bunch of hands pulling up in the air. If you, want, if you choose to download the app, there's one more step you have to do. Before you sign up or create an account, text my phone number. Don't do it right now. I do have it on mute because thankfully the Lord warned me before we started Sunday school this morning and the teens know. And he can, I always have some, do, some kind of crazy, goofy ringtone, especially when they text me about 8,000 times. <laughs> yeah, there was somebody guilty of that. But anyways, he was doing his joke. All that to be said, you text me, and then I have a code that I'll text right back to you, and when you click on it after you've downloaded the app, it instantly makes you part of the group. And you type in your name if you choose to share it with us, or you can remain anonymous. But um, like I said, this is just a tool, something we can do together. I highly encourage you to, but I'm not going to hunt you down or shame you if you don't. But I do challenge you. Spend time reading God's Word every day. Amen? At this time, would you take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 3 and stand with me? This chapter is not as long as the first two were, so we'll stand as we read God's Word this morning. Luke chapter 3, we're reading verses 1, all the way through verse 38. Luke chapter 3. The Bible says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trichonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough road smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force, or accuse anyone falsely, and be content with your wages. Now while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. 
But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. And when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Hesley, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matthias, the son of Simeon, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Jonan, the son of Reza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of, son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Janon, the son of Eliakim, the son of Malaiah, the son of Menah, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Mishan, the son of Amminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarah, the son of Reu, the son of Pele, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxa, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalaleel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing and worshiping our great God this morning. My Redeemer, whose price is the world blood, was ransomed. Thank you. 
with uh, this song, All Glory to Christ. Uh, you notice the tune is uh, very appropriate for New Year's Day. salvation is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And the Bible 
describes the gospel in many different ways. Sometimes it calls it the gospel of the grace of God. Totally fitting. God's grace to us. Sometimes it's described as the gospel of peace. Boy, real, everlasting, eternal peace. That's something this world is longing for. Sometimes it's referred to as the gospel of the Son. Sometimes it's specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it says it's the gospel of God. It is also described as the gospel of the glory of Christ. Its revelation describes it as the eternal gospel. But if you go back to verse 5 here in Colossians chapter 1, there's a description here as the gospel being the word of truth. Now, if you've ever seen that movie, A Few Good Men, you've probably at least seen the, the famous scene from it. It's the courtroom scene where he says, I want the truth. And the, the general or whatever his position was, his response is, you can't handle the truth. Now, I agree with that line if we are talking about the Bible. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, none of us truly can handle the truth of this word because you know what the truth tells us? We all are sinners. I don't like hearing that. Because we're sinners then, we all deserve to die and go to a real place called hell. None of us can handle that truth. And if that's all there was, it would be a life of despair and doom and gloom. Thankfully, that's not all the truth that this gospel tells us. The gospel truth, as many have called it, tells us that despite what we deserve, God lovingly gives us a far greater gift, a gracious gift, but it comes with conditions. We're to repent and believe. You know, the word gospel in the Greek comes from the word euangelion. It's where we actually get our English word evangelism. Well, to evangelize is to proclaim the good news. Now, the way that that word was actually used, especially in the Old Testament times, it was the word to describe the good news that would come back from a battlefield. That, that news of victory or, or success in the battlefield. We, we've been able to advance the line or whatever it may be. It was typically a victory report of some kind. Well, is that not fitting of the gospel truth? The good news? Because it's a victory that was won, that we didn't have to fight it. God fought the victory and won it all for us. Are you thankful for that? Yeah. Hopefully, we would all resoundingly say amen. We're thankful for what Jesus Christ accomplished for us. But the glorious truth of God's word ought to compel us to respond in many ways. The first thing that it ought to do is when someone gets saved, it ought to invoke in us a desire to go tell others about it. Both others who are saved, because hey, there is great, great joy and rejoicing when we hear about someone who gets saved. Amen? When I hear about someone getting saved, you know what that means? Well, I mean, we can list, list several different reasons, but the first thing that comes to my mind is, I have a new brother or sister in Christ. There's a new citizen going to be in heaven one day, and I can rejoice in that. And because even though this side of heaven... We may not be perfect, and we may not be able to perfectly get along. One day we're going to have perfect bodies, perfect minds, and we're going to love and, and be in awe of just how incredible heaven is and what God has in store for us. We can rejoice over that. But the second thing that hopefully the truth of the gospel compels us to respond is to defend it. And we live in a world today that wants to treat this book like it's useless. Like it's nothing but pages with words. Why defend it? To defend its veracity, if we, if, if we can put it that way, the word veracity would be maybe better translated its accuracy or legitimate truthfulness, dependability. That's a message we need to proclaim to a world around us that, hey, this is a book that's not just a bunch of fairy tales. This has real hope that can change your life. Do you believe that? Then do you tell others about it? We should. It shouldn't just sit on our shelves and be something that we do once a week. This should be a daily part of our life. Of course, the third thing that we ought to do. I'm sorry. Before we move on to the third one, take your Bible, go with me to Philippians 1. Philippians 1. And, and, and 
I'm going to bounce around. I'm going to read a lot of scripture here this morning. You can follow with me. I put the references up on the screen. So if I'm reading too fast, you at least know where I'm going or you can mark them down. But what does Philippians 1 6 tell us? Paul's writing here. He says, Being, or, I'm sorry, for I am confident of this very thing. I can depend on this. I can defend it with no doubts and no worries about it. He who began a good work in you will perfect it or complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I can depend on this book. And one of the wonderful truths I can depend on is that Jesus saved me. He can accomplish great things and he will. That word perfect is to complete Unfortunately, it's a lifelong process. I wish I could say that after even one year being saved, that hey, I'm a perfect Christian. <laughs> I wish. But it's a daily struggle. It's a daily pursuit that we must have. Look at what Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. If this is all the truth that I need in this world, do I know it well enough to when I encounter someone who questions it, I can say, no, this book is true because this is what it says here, and this is what it says here. Or can I approach someone who's dealing with something that's like, well, can God really help me with this problem in my life? Or can he really help me overcome this challenge? Well, here, let me show you this. Because here, he's someone who cares about you. And if he cares about even the tiniest of sparrows, surely he cares more about us. When God created this world, he pronounced it all good. But then you get to verse 26 of Genesis 1. And, and he gathers, gathers the Holy Spirit. And the Son of God says, let us make man in our image. As excited as God was when he created this world, when he came to create man, man was special. Why? We're not only made in his image, we were made and designed to have a relationship with him. We're the apple of God's eye in creation. I have great hope in it. I ought to know this truth so I can defend it, share it, and tell people this is something that you can depend on. Because Lord knows there's many things in this life that we can't depend on. Thirdly, you can go back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Not only should we proclaim it, not only should we defend it, but we should strive hard for its advancement. What do you think it means to strive hard? Is it something that can be done easily? It requires work. It requires effort. Look at what verse 27 says there. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving indicates rigorous of work. It, it describes discipline that's necessary. It doesn't just happen on its own. It's something we must work hard at. Of course, the next thing, we're to pursue that fellowship that we share with believers. Look at what Acts 2.42, going back to the beginning of the church, really. Acts 2.42, Paul was saying, well, the writer, and I believe it was Luke who was writing, said they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You know, we mentioned earlier that, that Bible reading you know, and, and it's not like a Bible reading app. If we do it, it's going to make us a perfect church. The fact of the matter is, not the perfect pastor, not the perfect Bible reading plan, not the perfect different ministries that we offer. Nothing's going to make this church perfect. But we have things, especially more than anything we have God's Word, that we should all unite behind. And it's telling us, as we saw an example of the early church, that we're just striving together. I'm not saying, shame on you, I'm not, this is not a guilt thing where I'm trying to promote the Bible reading thing, but, you know, if it's something we can do together and it's going to draw us even closer together because we're reading through the Bible at the same time and maybe it's going to provoke some extra conversations with each other that we might not normally have had, is that not something we should pursue after? When we have fellowships, you know, 
We, we have our statement as Baptists. We can't have a fellowship unless there's food around. That's fine. But what does food normally do? Why do we put food into it? Well, we're following the uh, example of the breaking bread together. We're following the early church's example. But why? You sit down and you have a meal with somebody. Yeah, you want to enjoy the food, but you're doing it together. There ought to be unity. Unity is something that we, we, we can't just hope that it happens. It's something that we as brothers and sisters in Christ are to pursue with each other. I, I know it's going to sound crazy, but we're actually supposed to love on one another. But it should be something that comes natural. It should be something that isn't a, a tiresome effort on our behalf. It's something that we get to do. I get to spend time with my family here today. That's, that should hopefully be an underlying attitude that we have when we come to church. Go to uh, back to Philippians chapter 1. And if you're wondering already, why don't you just read all the Philippians verses first? Though? We're, we're getting our page training. So for those of you who had some type of exercise resolution for New Year's here, you're at least giving your, your fingers your exercise this morning. Look at what Paul said though to the Philippians in verses 3 through 5 of chapter 1. To all, I'm sorry, grace? No. I need my glasses on. I thank my God in all my remembrance of Always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. We're going to see this in just a few moments when we start getting into the verses of Colossians here, but one thing Paul loved, he loved getting the words of brothers and sisters in Christ, even ones he never met. Even ones of where, in, in, in this case, at least in the case of the Colossians, he had worked with Epaphras, and Epaphras had gone out and, and probably started what maybe started out as just a small little Bible study group with two or three individuals and eventually grew into the church there at Colossae. Paul had never actually come yet to Colossae and, and met with them. In fact, you know, going back, we studied, uh, back at the end of the summer, we studied the book of Philemon. This church at Colossae, this is where Philemon, and his family and Onesimus were all from. Paul had never been there. He had met Philemon in a different city at one time when he was visiting. He'd never been to Colossae, but yet he rejoiced and thanked God because, look, I heard that you guys were growing in the Lord and that the love that you had for Christ was not only visible to one another, but the world around you was taking notice and they're talking about it. That is something that we ought to rejoice in. You know, one of the things I love when we do our missionary moments and we get updates, it ought to cause us to rejoice when we hear that one of our missionaries was able to lead someone to the Lord. Or they, they started a new Bible study group that's resulting in more young believers growing in Christ or hearing about the gospel and getting saved. That ought to cause our hearts to rejoice. That ought to be a response to the gospel news. <coughs> Of course, another response we find in 2 Timothy 1 8. 2 Timothy 1 8, Paul is instructing Timothy as a young pastor. He said, Look, you better uh, pull up your britches and be prepared. It's not going to be an easy job. In fact, you need to be prepared to suffer. <laughs> Paul's telling them. If we're in 2 Timothy 1 8, Paul is saying, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, if before you got saved, the person who led you to the Lord, or the preacher who maybe you got saved under, looked at you and says, Now, I want you to prepare, because I want you to get saved, but you better be prepared. You're going to join me in suffering. How many of you like, what's this suffering you're talking about? I mean, I thought getting saved just means I get to go to heaven. To be prepared is to consider things that may or may not happen, but to be ready for them. Now, Jesus told us, guess what? The world hates me. They're going to hate you too. Are you prepared and do you accept that understanding with a willingness to still go forward and proclaim the message? Uh, we can get all excited about, man, it's wonderful to be saved. I want to tell you how you can be saved because I want you to go to heaven. I, I don't want any of you to die and go to hell. And, and this is a, a book that I can depend on. And, and we're brothers in Christ and we can rejoice together, but we need to be ready 
for when the hard times come. I'm going to tell you right now. I can't guarantee this because the Bible doesn't tell us how difficult and bad things are going to get before he comes and he raptures his church. But he does tell us to be ready. To be prepared to suffer. One of the challenges that comes with that in the next response we find in 1 Corinthians 9 12 that while I'm prepared to suffer, I better make sure that I'm not letting anything hinder that gospel message with my life. I better make sure that there's no sin or nothing that's hindering it. As Paul said to the Corinthians, if others share the right over you, do we not mourn? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. You know, that's where Paul is kind of saying, look, I'd rather give up things that may not be wrong or right, but because I don't want anything in my life. There's nothing in my life, no preference that I have that's more important than someone seeing the love of Jesus Christ in my life or hearing the gospel message. Now, that's a tough one sometimes for, for believers for us to swallow because, well, well, but I'm free in Christ and it's not a sin, so I shouldn't have a problem. That shouldn't be the issue. I should be more concerned with, is there someone that may be hindered from seeing the gospel because of my preference or how I'm living. I should be so enamored with this truth that I don't want anything in my life to hinder. Of course, we all know, hopefully, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Most of us say, well, I how can I really be ashamed of the gospel? If it's God's wonderful news, who have you shared it with? Who have you told it to? This is a message that we are to proclaim and tell to others. And when we choose not to, for uncertainty or even fear of how people might respond to it, we're saying, well, I don't want to share this with you because I'm afraid of how you'll respond. Or I don't know how you're going to receive it, so I better just not do it. Now, we all believe that God is omnipresent. What I mean by that is he's present everywhere, right? So that means there's no place we can go where he's not with us. Now that brings us a sense of hope and, and encouragement, right? Knowing the Lord's always with me. I'm thankful for that. But it's also that kind of stern reminder that he then sees and knows everything. So when someone's standing in the aisle next to me at Walmart or somebody's out there while I'm pumping my gas and says, oh, yeah, yeah, how's the weather today? And you feel that nudge in your to tell them about me. They, 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 they probably don't look at that right now. Not. Is there anything that should ever cause us to be ashamed of it? Well, the answer is clearly no. Then what should our response be? Proclaim it. You see what he says, what Paul says there in that verse? It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Yes, is there a high likelihood? Do we want to play the probability and statistics game that if I witness to somebody, the chances are most people are going to reject the message I have? Yes! The Bible tells us wide is the path that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to life. But what happens when the Lord divinely puts me next to somebody who's searching for the gospel? Now, if he wants to save them, believe me, he will create the way for them to get saved. He will put the right person in their path and let them hear that message. But the point of the matter is we ought to take advantage of every opportunity because we don't want to be that hindrance. We don't want to be ashamed of it. But even furthermore, folks, there is great joy. Not only when we hear about somebody getting saved, but it's even more joyous when we get to be the person who leads them to the Lord. We don't save them. But man, when you get to be privileged to be there with someone, when they confess Jesus Christ as their Savior, it is incredible. Of course, a last response. You might say, you we haven't even gotten to the verses yet. I'm not going to try and finish this all today, so don't worry about that. But 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Having an understanding of how we respond to the gospel is critical as we get into this book. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 says, For our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We need to realize that the gospel truly carries divine empowerment and the ability to accomplish whatever God wants in our lives. Now Paul opens this letter in Colossians by expressing his love and his joy for the gospel. See, Paul wasn't just thankful for the result of salvation, but the fruit that was being born in the lives of those who believe it and keep it. And in verses 1 and 2, we see Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, here at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. This is just my opinion here. But I believe Paul was probably one of the most influential individuals in all of human history. No, human history books don't tell us about him. But the impact that he made on the world is going to be revealed in heaven one day. However, as we know from his life, he started out by pursuing the fame and recognition. But he did it as a butcher of God's people, his children. And he was simply one who knew about God from what the law told him. I mean, you remember, he said, you know, if anyone wants to boast about human accomplishments, I can put you to shame. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I know my stuff as it pertains to the law. But you know what the Lord revealed to me? It showed me that the law showed me I wasn't good enough. And I needed his love and forgiveness. And God graciously called him on that road to Damascus that day. He finally came to know the Savior. Of course, the rest is evidence of the power of God upon a life that seeks to obey. And guess what? You and I have access to that same power that God used in Paul's life. Amen? We can accomplish just as much if that's God's will for our life. See, but the, 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 the purpose there is not for us to see, well, I want to be like Paul. No, God, I want you to use me. That needs to be an attitude that we have in our hearts. I want to accomplish incredible things for God's glory. And even if they're things that the world never knows about, if my father does, that's what I want. Now, Paul had his doubters. People who said, oh, no, 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 you can't trust this guy, Paul. I'm sure there were many believers, even after he first got saved and God called him, they were just like, you want us to trust that guy? Did you hear what he did to the other believers in the town over there? Of course, even after he got saved and was evidence that he was preaching the gospel, there were even other believers who were just like, oh, you can't listen to him. So Paul acknowledges that God calls him. You see what he says there? God called me to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone begins to think, well, maybe that was Paul then saying, don't bother me because Jesus himself called me. Paul made it very clear on many occasions that he considered himself to be the chief recipient of God's grace because he considered himself the chief sinner. He said, there's no worse sinner in this world but me. If, if there was, and there isn't a different measure of grace when we get saved, but he said, hey, if there was someone who needed more grace than anyone else in this world, it was me. God saved me anyways. He, his claim to apostleship was to ensure all his readers that the authority that was given to him was due to the author of the message, that I'm just the messenger. I'm nobody important, but what I have to share with you is so important because it comes from Jesus Christ. You know, the following phrase, by the will of God, and it's okay because God chose to save you, God chose to be an apostle, right? You know, that phrase I think is important. And, and I, I believe any time Paul ever said that to someone, or even when he was writing this letter, I, I think it brought tears to his eyes. Because by writing it, Paul was acknowledging God's predetermined choice to not only save him, but to use him despite who he was and all the things he had done against him. He desired that relationship with the Lord because the Lord first desired it with him. It was by God's will. And so he willingly went out to spread the gospel in a far greater way than Saul, his unsaved life, ever did as it was truly opposed to God. Now Paul then mentions that Timothy was with him. 
And that's not to suggest that Timothy is somehow a co-author. Paul just shared a close relationship with Timothy. And Paul not only was able to lead Timothy to Christ, but God had instilled in Timothy's heart and said, look, God's using this to Paul somehow. So maybe there's some lessons that I can bring from Paul. Maybe, like, how can I go out and be used to accomplish God's glory? Not so much that he was trying to be like Paul, but he wanted to access that same power from God that Paul was accessing. You know, when we read about men like this in Scripture, it shouldn't be, man, I want to be another Paul. No, I want to be who God created me to be, but I want to be used by him. I want to walk in obedience the way he did. I can learn from his life lessons. Paul then identifies who this letter is addressed to. And I intended to get through much more, but I want to get through this point with our remaining time here. You might say, okay, wait a minute here then. There doesn't seem to be much left of this verse. Paul says, it's written to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. The word saints and the word faithful. You see them? Let me say, okay, so saints means that they were believers and, and faithful means that, you know, they, they were obedient to God's word, right? I think it goes much more beyond that. See, the word saints comes from the word hagios. Now in Greek, we commonly translate that as holy or holiness. What is holiness? The main idea behind holiness is separation. You know, the main reason that we can't get to God on our own good works is because God is perfectly holy. That means He's never sinned. And not only has He never sinned, He can't be in sin's presence. In the same way that, you know, if, if I were to go eat, a nice big bowl, and you know, you're like, why are you mentioning food? It's almost lunch time. But imagine a nice big bowl, and I hope this doesn't ruin it for you, but mashed potatoes, but garlic mashed potatoes. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I love garlic. And God bless me with a wife who also loves garlic, so we get along just fine, as long as we eat the same things. But for those who maybe don't like garlic, or maybe they can easily tell when someone's been eating garlic, it's kind of that like, woo or here's a piece of gum. In the same way that we kind of step back from maybe a smell or the sight of something that we just don't like, God physically cannot be in the presence of sin. He can't be near its scent. He can't be in its sight. So how in the world do we get to heaven? It's because Jesus Christ had to pay that sacrifice. He had to make it possible to literally put his blood over us that covered the smell and the sight and the stench of our sin. It had to cleanse us. Now, it's a price we couldn't pay on our own. It's what he did for us. But it means that once we get saved, we're to be separated from sin. We're not to be identified with it anymore. It ought not to have any place in our life. We don't even want the smell of it to be on us. We're to be separated under him. Holy. He desires to make us stand out of the world. Not to blend in with it. Furthermore, he says that you're not just saints. Those who are saved and set apart for a greater purpose and higher calling. But you're faithful brethren. Now, I've read through this passage, and, and Paul uses this, uh, it's very similar in some of his other letters, he calls them his faithful brethren, but so many times we read that, and we think that faithful is designed to describe the brethren. And not that we can't be faithful by his strength, by his power. But folks, may I dare suggest to you that the word faithful there doesn't point to the brethren. It points to Jesus Christ. Because what are the words right after faithful brethren? In Christ. He's the one who has always been faithful to us. Have there been moments where we've been unfaithful to him? Yes, there have been. But he's never failed us. He's never become unfaithful. And the reason I make this distinction is to indicate not only that Christ is also faithful to us, but he's the source of our faith and our separation unto God. And we must never stop praising or thanking him for it. Or for his faithfulness to us. Of course, grace to you and peace is Paul's common greeting. But even in that, it's important. 
Say, man, it seems like you're kind of stretching here, this introduction that seems like so much. Folks, every word of God is important to us. Grace and peace, what make them so incredibly special, is grace defines the way that God deals with us, and peace is what he gives us. So it's fair to say that God is the source of them both. Amen? So when he says grace and peace to you, he says, man, isn't it great, the wonderful grace that we have from our Father, and the peace that he allows us to have with him. Remember, prior to getting saved, and grace and peace to you is a phrase that can only be referenced to believers. Because if you haven't received that gracious gift, then what do you know about grace? Furthermore, before you get saved, you don't have peace with God. You're an enemy of God. As Romans 5 tells us, because we were justified, therefore being justified by faith, we have now. We now have peace with God and access to him that we didn't have before we got saved. <coughs> Grace and peace to you. I'm going to stop here this morning. And we'll pick up as we start getting into some of the main points. But I want you to consider something. How do you respond to the wonderful truth of the gospel. And I know, we just stretched the service here in the book of Colossians, but Paul's response to this truth is the response that he desires each of us to have. Not because I want to make you like me, because I want you to be like Jesus Christ. Ask yourself this. Have you ever proclaimed this truth to someone? Hopefully you can say yes. Have you ever defended God's word, the truth of say, look, hey, this is a book you can't depend on. How many people have you told that to? And every time I ask one of these questions, if you say yes, that doesn't let you off the hook. If you say yes, then my next question would be, when, who are you going to proclaim it to next? If you say, no, I haven't proclaimed it to anyone, or I haven't done it in a long time, don't just hear these words and say, okay, yeah, that's a good word. Yes, yes, the gospel truth. Yes, I love it. I'm thankful for it. Do something with it, will you? It's the power of God unto salvation. It's the thing that we can rejoice over every single day in this coming year. Proclaim it. Defend it. But that also means that we have to work hard. We're going to have to strive hard for its advancements. That means I have to make time to spend in this word every day to know him. Because I either want to be used to be leading someone to the Lord, or I want to be used to help you build up my brother or sister in Christ. Quite frankly, I should be looking for opportunities to be doing both. My former pastor had a statement that I think is vital. We ought to always be seeking to be discipled in our walk with the Lord. But we should also be seeking to disciple someone else. Meaning, I want to continue to grow in the Lord. I want to continue to learn more and more about Him. But then I also want to be able to take that same truth and wisdom and give it and share it with others so I can see them grow. <clears throat> quite frankly, you either ought to be discipling someone or you ought to be being discipled. And quite frankly, the best position is to be both. That ought to be our goal. But it's something that comes with hard work. Folks, I believe we have a wonderful church here. But if we want that unity and fellowship to continue to grow, we have to continue to pursue it. Amen. We need to look for opportunities to love one another, to encourage one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we come to the hard one that we're mentioning. We need to be prepared. That it's going to be faced with great opposition. We take a stand for Christ, we're going to have an enemy who's very real, who's going to oppose every step we take. We need to be prepared that sufferings might be in our future. If we're going to live for him. We also need to be examining our lives so that nothing in us is hindering the gospel message. We want it to be seen clear. We're never to be ashamed of it. Lord, if you want me to share it, I will. Yes, Lord. As Samuel said, here my Lord send me. That needs to be our heart. But we can do all that. Because remember, when, when you got saved, when I got saved, God didn't just give us Okay, here's your citizenship paper. Here's your fire insurance. Well, if anything, he handed us our adoption papers and says, I want you. I'm 
I'm choosing to love you. And not only am I choosing to love you and redeem you and justify you and sanctify you, I want to use you. And so whatever is necessary for you to accomplish my will for your life, I'm going to provide it. I've given you my Holy Spirit, and he will be with you wherever you go. What is your response to what we claim to believe is the greatest news ever? With your head bowed and your eyes closed. I don't know how to put it any other way but simply. I'm not asking you to make a New Year's resolution here. Quite frankly, I don't put a lot of stock in it. I'm just asking you to make a choice to humbly come before your Lord and Savior today. It's the first day of a brand new year. And say, Lord, will you please use me? Father, will you give me strength to walk with you today? Will you give me strength to walk with you tomorrow and every day this year? Will you use me for your glory and honor? Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, if that's our heartbeat, and Psalm 37, 4 says, he who delights, or he shall be her, <laughs> delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. If it's our desire, not to be glorified, and we take true delight in him, there's nothing he won't accomplish for us. Father in heaven, as we come before you now, Lord, we need the very first thing we must stop <coughs> and acknowledge and say is, Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us. And Father, continue to give us a wonderful love for you. Father, I pray that you do a work of my life in our hearts. Father, I pray that this might be a year in which we see more people come to know you as Savior. That we would see more believers begin to walk with you more faithfully. May that be our pursuit. May that be our goal and Father empower us to accomplish. We ask these things in your precious and your most holy name. As we sing this song this morning, the Bible tells us one way you can show the Lord you love him. Obey him. Will you obey him this year? Will you stand with me as we sing?